intros right okay so can everybody hear me okay yep loud and clear yep. is it time to start yep. 206 yeah all right so a little bit about larvae um this is not a complete list of all known larvae in the literature it's going to be a huge topic to tackle but it's a little bit of what i know and my experience with uh, collecting and uh yeah, I, I don't know how I got into my interest in larvae and pupae, except that I like matching up adults with their immature stages, and it was a challenge. So uh, I uh, started saving and figuring out how to preserve and, and work on them. And let's see. Um, so yeah, uh, the main habitats, of course, are uh, <clears throat> dead wood, and and the the standing dead wood is has a very different fauna in it than the stuff that falls and starts rotting on the ground. So you lose your standing fauna when the tree falls, and uh, that needs a lot more study. I've been working on these beaver girdled trees down here and uh, <clears throat> and the, the fungi on the dead wood is also uh, a source of food for a lot of these critters. Uh, then there's a whole other realm of soil dwelling larvae and adults um, and they, it could be any kind of loose soil with leaf litter on top uh, to pure sand, uh, like this scene in the Bahamas here. Um, so uh, let's see. Let me go back. I'm uh, going too fast here. There we um, yeah, it's a sensitive mouse. Um, anyway, um, and uh, I, we'll talk a little bit about rearing. Um, and you know you often find larvae in the field. Uh, you might find a single larva and wonder what the hell it is. And uh, there's only one way to find out. Uh, well, now these days we have DNA, but uh, the best thing is when in doubt, rear it out. And uh, so that's what I uh, <clears throat> try to to do. Um, I should mention that the larval stage is really the most important in the life cycle of, of these beetles because it often is the longest stage that these insects are in and they do the feeding and the damage. So uh, we have a, a group of tenebs that are considered stored food pests and uh, and a lot of specialized uh, invaders of, of food caches by both people and other animals. And then there's the myrmecophile uh, clades that uh, highly specialized ant guests and termites too. Um, and uh, lots to get into. It's very hard to get the larvae of those. Uh, let's see. I think this is the next slide, yes. So yeah, um, just some characters to, uh, to think about uh, when you study larvae. Um, the uh, dissection of the head is tricky, but it's important to get to the mouth parts. And there's that, uh, <clears throat> that little hypopharyngeal sclerome in the middle of the head that the mandibles press in on and it's like a third tooth and that should be dissected out and illustrated if possible. It has a distinctive shape sometimes. But uh, anyway, the most uh, informative and easily recognizable part of the larva is often the rear end. And uh, that's where 
a lot of the characters are that are um, distinctive. Um, in the pupae, um, sort of the same idea, the uh, cuticle and projections. Um, the pupae, I should say that uh, it's a very short term um, part of the life of, of the beetle. And all coleoptera, as far as I know, have a very short pupil stage. They're not the overwintering stage. If anybody knows of one, I'd like to hear about it. Um, so you've got like under two weeks usually to um, find and rear the pupa or get it preserved before it uh, becomes adult, depending on what you want. So, um, and I always advise collectors to save that larval skin that goes with the pupa. It's sometimes hard to collect it. It's sometimes when you split a log open, the stuff flies all over the place and you can't reassociate. But it's an important thing to have preserved with the pupa and can help you match it up with larvae and adults later. Let's see. Uh, yeah, a word about gin traps. Uh, the term gin trap was coined by uh, Howard, I think that was his name, Hinton, way back in the 30s. And it comes from the term used to describe the cotton gin combing device that removed the seeds from, from cotton. Um, I don't know where he came up with it, but it stuck. Um, we also call them lateral lamellae or abdominal projections or whatever. But uh, the cool thing about these, uh, and Pat mentioned some of this yesterday, if you're a small predator, you uh, got to be careful of, of those opposing teeth because the pupa is pretty active, even though it's a resting developmental stage, they can defend themselves and uh, they rotate the abdomen really quickly. And these opposing teeth come together and can crush a mite or a small larva like uh, Therevid fly larvae or common predators, of Teneb pupae. But um, anyway, this example of Idiobates, which is closely related to our common mealworm, Tenebrio. Um, oh, let's see, I went backwards. <clears throat> One of the things I like to do is keep track of the developmental timing and the host tree or habitat or whatever it is. So I try to label um, all of that stuff. And here's an example, uh, two examples of reared adult, adults um, in captivity that were collected in uh, dead standing wood. And in the gelatin capsules are the larval exuvia and in some cases the pupa too. What's What's cool about this is that <laughs> you have to really beware of when you're rearing these things, you have to watch them almost daily because when the beetle decloses, uh, becomes a beetle and kicks off the pupil exuvia, uh, the first thing it eats is its shed skins and it will totally erase your evidence of what the larva and pupa were. So you've got to watch them, and before they harden up and start to eat, get those exuvia out of there and keep them safe. <laughs> so it's just one little trick of, of rearing an association of adults with larvae. Uh, I'll start off with uh, looking at the lagrines. And uh, yeah, up top here, some of these images are not mine. I, stole them off a bug guide in other places. So acknowledgements to everybody. <laughs> yeah, Lagrion larvae have uh, typically um, their elongate 
critters with uh, often a lot of CT. The, uh, the urogonfi at the end um, can be, well, in this case of Lagria, they're little, little cone-shaped projections. And in this uh, Arthromacra, it's, uh, they're well sclerotized cone-like things with sharp points on the end. So um, just some examples of, of Lagrinine larvae, but they're, uh, they vary a lot. That genus Peritonitis is a thing that I studied a while back. And their larvae kind of look like a miniature version of this Lagria, but uh, a little more thick bodied and uh, they live in dead hanging leaves and graze on the mold in the dead leaves. And they pupate like coccinolidae do. They glue their tail down and molt, but the larval skin stays on the pupa at the uh, end of the abdomen. And the pupa sticks to the substrate by its shed skin. And um, so that's a kind of a cool character. Um, we have, let's see, what's next? Yeah, the, the Nilio, genus Nilio and relatives, I guess at the moment it's only one genus, but uh, this is a cool group that I uh, originally, based on pupil characters, here's the, uh, the deal with the rear end glued down to the substrate like a coccinellid does. And um, this reminded me of what peritonitis did. So I uh, proposed that Nilio was a lagrine, but I, uh, I guess I screwed up. I didn't believe Doyen's uh, internal characters and uh, proposed that it be moved to the lagrines. But I'm backing off on that. Anyway, they're, they're cool critters. They're external feeding on fallen wood and grazing on fungi and maybe lichens. And the larvae are colorful, dark pigmented. And this is a, a thing of larvae that occur out um, on surfaces. And the pupae are doing the same thing. And notice these little knobby uh, projections on the pupal abdomen. I got to witness this in Venezuela many years ago um, with uh, a cluster of pupae, sort of like these guys. Um, and I noticed that there was a, a liquid, when I touched the pupa, it would rear up. And the, uh, there was a white liquid coming from those knobs. So that's a chemical defense thing that needs to be studied. Um, don't know if anybody's looked at it, but a cool thing. Um, yeah, Pat mentioned uh, his Phrenopatines yesterday, and here's his drawing of the, the big Phrenopates with the pasalid like horn. And they do live in rotten, fallen, kind of wet wood like pasalids do. I don't know that they have the parental care that pasalids have, but that needs to be looked at too. But uh, very curious pupa. And here's our little North American Eastern thing, Thaidas, which uh, Laura has been described. I think Dan Young and others have worked on it. And it's uh, another little guy. It looks like a miniature Uloma, but the uh, larval rear end is really distinctive. Might be able to open a can with that. Now the, uh, the Bolotopha giants, um, another fungus feeding group. Um, in North America, we have our famous Cornutus and um, it lives in the big woody brackets of Ganoderma and other polypores. And the whole life cycle is within the fungal tissue, uh, a woody chunk of, bracket 
And the pupa down here uh, of, of the male, you can see that the horns are already formed in the pupa. So it's, uh, the pupa is a mold for the adult beetle's body. And, uh, and over in the east too, we have uh, the genus Bolotophagus. It's not, a, not one of the horned ones, but uh, here's the larva of our eastern uh, Corticula, which is in this white fungus here. This is Perenoporia subacida, is what I've identified it as. And I've made a lot of collections of these little larvae and reared them in this fungus. So if you see a white tree trunk or a fallen log with white cheese like covering underneath, check it out. You might find uh, Bolotophagus there. And uh, they have an interesting larval development. When the larva gets to the mature size, it will make a ring of uh, uh, fungus tissue, or actually uh, excavate a ring around a button of fungal tissue. And then it'll go inside that button and create a pupil cell. And so if you see these circular excavations on the white fungus, that's it. Uh, the European reticulatus here, uh, this figure, I can't remember the author here, but good example of larvae and pupae that are not preserved well. Um, they should be creamy white like this guy. Um, preservation of larvae and pupae um, is a trick because if you want to do DNA work, you can't uh, cook them. However, dropping them in hot water to fix the proteins before putting them in alcohol is my preferred technique, but it's, it's really for morphology only. But if you put uh, larvae and pupae straight into alcohol, you'll get this darkening. And uh, but anyway, you can see the uh, gin traps of this guy. And if you, I don't have a image of our native corticula, but the pupae are of, of kind of different. And I'm thinking, that it should be put in a, a separate genus. But um, again, larval and pupil characters help decide that. And also the fungal host. Um, this European one lives in big woody brackets, whereas our corticula is a specialist in this perenniporia here. So let's see, oh, I went backwards again. <clears throat> okay, some larvae just to show the diversity of larval forms. Our eastern uh, Maracantha uh, in the Amerigmines, and most Amerigmines, most of the larvae I've seen from all over the world have these excavated rear ends. The ninth pergam is, is bowl shaped. And here's a younger instar here, we can see it a little better. Um, then there's other larvae in the similar habitats that have bullet-shaped rear ends. And these Androchoros are incredible. They're in uh, dry tree holes and uh, incredibly active when you discover them. They flip around like snakes and they can burrow backwards as fast as they can forwards. So they're really good at stick escape tactics. And so I think that's what the, the rounded parabolic rear end is, is about. Um, yeah, here's the uh, tree hole habitat. And uh, this is a dry tree hole. It, when it rains, it stays dry in there. And uh, this is a habitat that I've focused on for a long time. Um, there are two species of neatus in North America. Uh, what I call wild mealworms. Um, and they're often found in the dry frass in the bottom of these basal tree holes. They can be in knot holes up in the, in the canopy too, uh, any dry cavity. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and speaking of neatus, uh, for a long time, these things were uh, thought to be in the same genus and classified that way. But uh, 
I've been working on other details and looking at the larvae, um, obviously the, the rear ends are different. The meatus has this single point with an assemblage of a little CD. The uh, Tenebrio, this is the type species of our family, Tenebrio molitor, has uh, two urogonthal spines and then these other accessory little uh, peg-like CD and a lot of related Teneb larvae, um, including Zophobus, have this arrangement. Um, not sure whether it means a relationship or not. But anyway, these two are clearly not that closely related. And the pupae also show some differences. The uh, neatus has these backward pointing gin trap uh, toothed edges, and whereas the uh, Tenebrio have pretty much uh, equally facing toothed uh, blades. And uh, a lot of details on the uh, spines along the outer edges of the, the projections. And then the uh, Urogonthi shows some differences too. So all of these are characters that need to be looked at when you're describing a pupa or trying to uh, identify it. Um, yeah, getting into the opatrines, uh, this is the larva of one of my favorite beetles, Amodnus fossor, is our Eastern one. And it has a wide distribution. Um, and it's a strict sand specialist living behind beaches, um, not actually out on the beach usually, but back in the flats uh, behind the shrub zone. And these things can handle some pretty hot temperatures. Um, anyway, so we have some curious little uh, spines, I guess, well, they're not spines, they're actually articulated heavy CT on the labrum and uh, sides of the head. And um, yeah, the apex of the abdomen has a mixture of fine and thick CD. This is not too different from other blapstenines and things that I've reared. I, I don't have pictures of many of them yet, but uh, a little bit of an upturned abdominal apex with a, a row of CD. And sometimes the abdomen will be a, a little shovel shaped. And I think this is for, for being able to push through sand, but they can also move backwards pretty quick too. So, um, and I should mention at this point, the, the fact that Larvae, especially the sand burrowers, the front, the uh, pro tibia, uh, pro legs of the, uh, yeah, the first thoracic segment are generally much more robust, like twice the size of the mid and hind thoracic segments. So uh, that's a character to, it's actually a good character to recognize Teneb larvae if you're digging through the sand. Uh, let's see, yeah, the, the Epitragines, um, these are our three Eastern genera. And uh, the larvae have these cone-shaped rear ends. Again, they're all sand burrowers, um, but these, uh, oops. <clears throat> so we have three genera here. The, I think this one, is, yeah, the Shenicus, Othrotes, and Epitragodes, and they're all uh, Eastern beach dwellers, but also get inland to some of the ancient dunes and pine barrens. But um, this is Bothrotes, the, uh, the males have the simple pronotum, 
and the females have this elaborate sculpturing. So I don't know what's up with that. Usually it's the males that have the horns and that kind of modification. What's cool about the epitragans and related groups is that the gin traps are not uh, protruding toothed things. They have a uh, cup-like apparatus between uh, these first five or six segments. And the abdomen, when it rotates, does the same kind of thing. But I, I think these are probably designed to be mite killers. Uh, a lot of predatory mites will attack pupae. And, uh, but this is a defense mechanism that uh, kind of cool. But anyway, uh, epitragines, all the ones that I've reared have uh, turned out to be uh, bear bearing these cup-like gin traps, different from other things. Here are the larvae blown up a little bit. And they're really similar. I, I don't know, other than the subtle coloration differences, there's really not much you can go on like for writing the key. And uh, they're hard to collect. They're, uh, you know, you often only find one or two at a time. <laughs> going a little further south, we have the genus Brancus, which I'll talk about later this week. Um, again, they're larvae. Very similar to the epitragines, but they have a, a crown-like rear end with a shovel-shaped area and an assemblage of a peg-like CD in the, on the disc and then this ridge and then a couple of little, I don't know, they may be remnant urogonfi or whatever, but a couple of little upturned CD at the, at the tip. And uh, again, strict sand specialists. This uh, this adult is Brinkus gerasorum, which I described from San Salvador, uh, not Central America, but the one in the Bahamas. So, and here's the pupa of that. And uh, again, the gin traps are the cup-shaped opposing blades and um, there are little trigger hairs in here that if you take a human hair or the tip of a fine insect pin and put it in there it'll pinch it and you can even pick up the pupa with uh, with that so kind of cool um yeah i mentioned larval coloration i some years back, we were at, uh, at Oregon Pike National Monument right on the Mexican border. And I got this, uh, my first specimens of what was then called Bicria. It's now been put in uh, Tricaton, which is cool. But this thing, it does have some unique apomorphies. And uh, I managed to, to dig up a few larvae too. And I was surprised to see how uh, well marked they were. Most Teneb larvae are pretty clean colored, especially the soil and leaf litter dwellers. But this one was perfectly camouflaged in the pile of uh, creosote bush frass that the leaf cutter ant was piling up. So, and another note, if you do collect a myrmecophile, get some of the ants along with it and associate them in the same collection. Uh, always a good thing. Um, Trachycelus, I don't have larvae for, but we've talked about this before. And um, it's uh, introduced to the new world. I, I actually got to sink a Melchimer species, which not everybody gets to do every day, but it's a cool beastie. Um, I had larvae from the, uh, I had larvae from a collection when I was in Malaysia many years ago of a little uh, brown species. And uh, I don't know what's happened to them, but I remember showing it to John Lawrence and he said, 
I thought that's what Trichocelus larvae would look like. So there you go. Anyway, something still to look for. This beetle made a liar out of me. I published in Coleop Bulletin uh, back in 90, what was it? No, oh, uh, oh 04, I think it was, on the distribution of it. And when I had worked out this synonymy, and I proposed that it had been eliminated from North America because it's probably not able to survive the winters. Well, we went to a little island on the Maryland Virginia line in the Chesapeake Bay two or three summers ago, and I found a whole big series of it. So there you go. Uh, this cool critter, Nemodinus, and another pure sand specialist, and a really distinctive critter with a scarab like teeth on the front tibia. Um, this is Galamis Dunes in uh, Southern California, one of the sites that it's been collected at. And then uh, up in Southern Nevada, just south of the, uh, what is it? Nellis Air Force Base, there's some dunes. And we were out there at dusk one eve and this, this thing came out all over the sand and they were all males trying to take flight, but it got windy and started spitting rain. So we had to put our black light away, but it turns out that's compares well with Casey's type of uh, this other species that he described from Southern Utah. So there are definitely two species in this genus. And uh, Under study, and I could use uh, any, if any of you have collected this thing anywhere in the dunes of southwestern US, uh, especially I'm interested in the, the California stuff, like from Death Valley. I have a single specimen, I think this is it, that uh, Lindsay had collected and uh, look, would like to see more. Anyway, out in uh, Arizona, in 94, I collected, we were out in the dunes and um, digging for all kinds of tenebs and getting some, some goodies, but it was slow. But this, this little larva tumbled out and it's, uh, yeah, 13 millimeters. So it's, it's probably a full grown, if it is in fact, Nemodinus. Um, so this is one that uh, definitely needs need to search for. It's got these wacky little remnants of urogonfi with CT on them and uh, large pigapods, not atypical for another pameliine thing. But anyway, um, definitely of interest. Or is it? Uh, a first instar tingler. What price larval studies? Uh, let's see. Here we go to southern coastal Georgia in the live oak forests in the palmetto scrub. And this was another larval discovery I made a few years back uh, for. Uh, Liptotus cribratus and uh, figured out that it was living in dead branches on live trees. And if I found a recently fallen branch, I could collect the larvae and rear a few out. So that happened. There's another, uh, again, it's, it's dead standing wood. And in this case, it really matches the, uh, go back there. <clears throat> It really matches the distribution of the uh, the southern live oak, the Quercus virginiana, and uh, that was its major host um, wherever I've collected it. And I've been, I've found it in Texas and all through Florida and up to uh, 
we've even got a record from that corner of Virginia had to, yeah, so uh, it's also in these sandhill habitats, the longleaf pine and turkey oak and uh, lots of other good tenebs here too. There's uh, an endemic Blapsteinus, whoopee, uh, polypleurus, all kinds of good stuff. But anyway, um, if you split these dead branches um, and poke around, you will get the larvae. And uh, a related one that I did in the same paper was the uh, Sibdalus. And uh, it's a pretty much California endemic, but it's one of the commonest beetles. I mean, if you've ever, if you're from California, this is a dirt bug. I mean, it's just everywhere under any uh, loose bark on the tree or on, on the ground. But um, to my surprise, the pupa and larva were undescribed, so I had to work on that. Um, it was often related to this Quercus gariana, which is a white oak group. But anyway, um, the larvae are uh, pretty good size, and with these wicked urogonthal spines and accessory pegs. Um, let's see, did I go too far again? And uh, the pupae are uh, pretty spiny and uh, I don't know, uh, the pronotum of the pupa can often have hairs or spines in various arrangements. So that's something else to keep track of and the urogumphy. And uh, yeah, let's see, I think we did this view already. I have another, yeah, this is cool. This is uh, two different specimens, one preserved with the urogumphy opened and another within in the uh, pinched position. So I think this is uh, definitely anti-predator and I've played with these live larvae uh, this and Glyptotus both by uh, drawing a, one of my hairs through that, uh, that gap and they will pinch. And again, you can pick the larva up and it will squirm around and then drop. So I think it's definitely defending itself against other larvae or whatever in the burrow of the dead wood that it's in. Um, there's the Sib pupa and more details and uh, let's see, yeah, there's the oblique view, really uh, wicked looking gin traps, uh, single curved spines opposing each other. So they must be uh, trying to defend themselves against a different predator than the ones that go for the pupae with the uh, serrated teeth. <laughs> But uh, here we find a pupa in a fallen oak branch and with larval skin. So yeah, <clears throat> so here's the comparison between Sibilus and Glyptotus. They're pretty closely related critters. I, I don't know phylogenetically where they'll come out, but figure it out one day. But the pupae will give us a another little suite of characters. Um, yeah, and here's, uh, let's see, uh, a related genus, the uh, Haplandrus fool the peas, another Eastern thing in dead standing wood again. And this is a page from St. George's uh, very early collection of larval larval descriptions, and uh, he nailed this one pretty good. He, at the time though, uh, <clears throat> this was, the genus Haplandris was kind of a dumping ground. Uh, 
and I got a chance to clean that up a little bit a few years back. And here's a comparison to uh, Glyptotus. And if you look at descriptions of helipine larvae, which I don't have images of, but they're very similar to this too, except that most of those, as far as I know, are soil dwellers. Um, they'll go for the interface of rotten wood and sometimes in wood, but a very similar rear end. So there must be uh, defending themselves the same way in a burrow. Um, this is another larval study I did with, uh, again, trying to figure out what haplandrous was and what was not. And so there used to be uh, Yeah, I, I moved um, Haplandrus ater uh, into Metaclissa uh, based on larval characters and an adult too. I did a lot of dissections, but uh, it was a distinctive larva and you find it often with uh, larvae of Centronopus, but it's, um, and the larvae do look very similar with these widely separated, upturned urogonthi. But uh, Metaclissa larvae have a mixture of long, fine seed and these little stout ones. And uh, that was a difference that I noticed in my mixed larvae samples and was able to sort them pretty quick. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, Centronopus has only a few long CD and uh, dark punctures. So they're easy to separate, but they do live side by side. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll go into questions here. Uh, anything you have on habitat or characters or whatever, send them on. Let me see. Uh...